Hello and welcome to Aspiring Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. Each week, we'll be chatting with various leaders from all different walks of life, learning from their experiences and sharing their advice. It's the perfect podcast for somebody wishing to step into a new leadership role or for a leader who's already there wishing to continue their development. If you'd like, share and subscribe to the podcast. Hey, everybody. Uh, Happy Thursday. You're very welcome to this week's episode of Aspiring Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. Again, so grateful for all the listeners over the last couple of weeks. Um, It's it's excellent. People are listening all over the world. It's it's great to look at the world map. There's people in Africa, Asia, Australia, America, and and all over Europe who are listening to the podcast and hopefully taking great learnings from, from the guests because ultimately it's the guests who are the stars of this show. They have such fascinating stories to tell and I'm, I'm so appreciative of them giving their time because look, there are lots of people who, who are busy and, and who have said no to me. So I'm usually grateful to them. Uh, again, please like, share, subscribe, rate the podcast. All of those kind of things help to generate a little bit of activity around it and promote it within Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So, this week's guest is, is Sandra Stapleton, a lady that I've worked with uh, for the past year and a half or so. But before I get into that, uh, this week's coaching question again is very simply, what judgments are you holding about a situation that are preventing you moving forward with it? So perhaps it's an individual on your team at work, perhaps it's something in your personal life, but you're you're placing judgments upon it. And I know, I know that um, impacts me a lot from time to time and it's something that I'm continuously working on and reflecting on and writing about so particularly in a system when you work within an organization there's all kinds of judgments to do with hierarchy to do it your role to do it another person's role so it's important to be aware of those judgments in a system and what's happening and who how things play because ultimately yes we're, we're humans but we're quite chaotic and there's a lot of we, we crave that little bit of structure but we're actually living in a world of chaos and it's, it's good to embrace that but uh, yeah just to repeat again what what judgments are you holding at the moment that may be preventing you from moving forward or having a different perspective on on a person or a situation and if those judgments weren't there what would be different about that situation so again if you get a little bit of time over the weekend or this evening or even right now um perhaps be great to write a couple of things so sandra stapleton um when i began to explore moving into a management role i was speaking with uh, the director in our organization rachel and rachel said the first person you need to speak with is sandra she has a lot of experience and she moved into a leadership role recently and she did it very well so um rather than me spending any longer speaking about sandra and her experience uh, let's hand it over to sandra and have a chat with her hey sandra how are you getting on thanks a million for making time this morning to chat to me how are you keeping pleasure it? good yeah really good thank you that's good how do you enjoy the working from home aspect um look i've adapted to it like everyone else um it's been good it's been really good actually if i've been honest just having more time at home uh, less time in the car and uh more time with the family as well so um yeah no it's it's i think the longer we're in this the, the more the easier it is yeah, I agree completely. I, I absolutely love it, to be honest with you. It's, the quality of life is so much better. Now, I would like a little bit more balance, but uh, it, it, it definitely is getting easier and adjusting to it. Yeah. So tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, kind of what your role is. And I, I, you're a long time in, in Oracle, but maybe a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are. Yeah, so um, so I'm in Oracle over 20 years, uh, started off as a graduate, uh, ended up staying, have moved around quite a bit in my time, um, my, mainly in kind of marketing programs, demand generation, project management type roles. And I'm a leader, I suppose I'm a people leader, really only about three years, but it feels like a lot longer because I was doing a lot of project management. So I was leading, but through influencing um outside of work then i'm a mother to uh three children i have a husband uh we live in dublin and um at the moment i mean there's a lot of a lot of family time uh, a lot of quality time actually 
um, and it's uh, it's been it's been really nice. How are you balancing that as well at the moment? Because you have three kids, there's homeschooling, you're in a fast paced environment um, that's expanding all of the time. Yeah. So how are you mm-hmm. balancing that? Look, I mean, I have a leader, my leader. So my direct manager has been really supportive uh, of the, you know, working from home, the fact that the children are at home, schools are closed at the moment. Um, look, I try not to stress too much Um I'm realistic about what will get covered in the day with the children. Um, I try to finish up a meeting five minutes early, you know, correct some homework or some schoolwork that they've done, get them set, send them off for another half hour. They can do something, come back to me. So I just kind of adapt. It's just in my day. I suppose I probably don't have that hour lunchtime that I would traditionally have had. It is a little bit more of kind of homeschooling, getting the kids lunch together as well, getting them set for the afternoon so that I can do my meetings, I can do my work. And they're also kind of content and they're also set up for the afternoon. So look, it's full on. You're trying to do two jobs. Um, I'm more ruthless with my time in work. If somebody wants my time, I, you know, I'm, you know, looking at reports and, and things that will add value and not really focused on the things that won't add the value. So I, I would say they're kind of maybe some of the changes that I've had to make. And that's kind of just how I'm adapting with it. Okay. Great stuff. So it's about a little bit of structure. I mean, make sure in the time that you're spending with people is quality time, whether it be at work or at home as well. When, yeah, exactly. when I, um, I was saying before you came on, Sandra, when I went to speak with Rachel about moving into um, a management role, she said, you have to speak with Sandra Stable. That's the first pe- person you have to speak with because one of the early days when she started an article, you came to her and you said, I want to be a manager for you. So tell me a little bit about when you realized you wanted to move into people management and how you made that tr- transition. Yeah, and for me, it very much also was kind of where I was in my personal life so I had had my family so I had just I had had three pregnancies very close together I had spent the guts of four years away from the business I was in and out you know for very short times in between each of my three children when I came back to work I knew I wanted to focus on me not necessarily wanting to be you know a VP or whatever but I knew I wanted to focus on me my development my career Um, And I wanted something different. I wanted a new challenge. And, you know, sometimes people say, are you a born leader? No, I'm not a born leader. I I actually, I'm I'm a twin. I'm the youngest of a twin. I'm actually the youngest in my family. I was always the youngest in my class. Uh, I was always the youngest in university. So actually, I probably was more of a follower than a leader. And actually leading was something that really, when I started to have a family, I really kind of went, you know what, actually, I am a leader and I think I can do this. And I I actually got a new kind of more confidence and more kind of self-belief and more, you know, I just kind of, and I also really wanted to try something different. And I also had worked for some great leaders in the past, some not so good, but I'm also a firm believer that you learn as much from the the not so good as you do from from the good leaders, uh, because sometimes you learn what not to do. Um, and I'd worked for a lot of really good leaders and I went, you know what, I can do this. This isn't rocket science. Um, and I felt that I could I could actually help develop people. I'd also spent a lot of time, um, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, mentoring people, helping people who were BDCs, maybe progress into a programs role or a project management type role. So I suppose I'd kind of had a little bit of kind of mentorship kind of experience and I'd actually really enjoyed it and I knew that by the role that you know that obviously I went for that I was successful in getting was about you know also kind of helping people who were young enough in their career um, and helping them as well to become successful in their current job but also to think about how I could develop them and how I could help them move internally uh, within Oracle. Okay, very good. When when you when you eventually then moved into that role, and it's great actually. Something that's coming through with all of the people that I've spoke with is is how they leverage their experience in their personal life. So you becoming mm. a mother to then develop skills that had helped them as a leader. But when you moved into that role, what were some of the biggest shocks? Or yeah, what were some of the, some of the biggest shocks that you found? Uh, I think the biggest thing I had to adapt to was not owning my own time. Not you know, being able to structure and set out my day and say, these are the projects that I own and that I can, I'm 100% in control of them. Uh, I was relying on my team to get my number. I was relying on my team, 
you know, I was also, I could get a call at any time. I could get asked for help, support, different things. So that was probably the biggest thing was that kind of time management. How do I manage my time? How do I set expectations with my team about when I'm available, when I'm not? Um, and, you know, you learn by failing. So, I mean, yes, I've probably been too available um, in the very early part of my leadership uh, career. Um, and in time, you kind of learn and, you know, set kind of, I suppose, where you can add value, but also empowering people to also make their own decisions. I think that's a big part of be being a leader is empowering your team um, to not always come back and fall back on their manager uh, to make a decision or to help them with a the decision, but you know, to try and make that decision themselves and to feel comfortable and confident that they're making the right, the right decision uh, when they do so. Um, what's coming through there is, is, is having strong people around you. Um, one of the things that strikes me, having been lucky to work with a number of members off the core team over the last couple of years is, is generally how strong they are. What are some of your tips for people around hiring the right people? Hiring the right people. So um, past behavior is a really good indicator of future behavior. So I would say that is probably one of the best tips that I could give. So if, and also the, the amount of work that they put into an interview. For example, I had interviews this week and it was quite clear who actually put the time and effort into the interview. If they put the time and effort into the interview, you know they're gonna put the time and effort into other things. Because again, that's past behavior, which will generally be a good indicator for future behavior. Uh, so that for me would be the number one tip. Also, do they have, are they hungry? Are they eager? Do they want to learn? Or are they just talking about buzzwords? You know, is there substance to what they're talking about? But really, you know, are they, do they have the hunger and the drive? So are they, are they curious? Um, pat, looking at their past behavior because it would be a good indicator um, you know and just energetic I think someone who has energy and also positivity and they're you know sometimes people will know will be able to talk the talk in the interview but I think you know you can probe I always ask different questions around you know what do you really enjoy about your current job but you know on the flip side then what frustrates you you know so trying just to ask different questions um different scenarios, how they've dealt with things in the past can actually be a really good um, indicator as well as to, you know, what they would be like in your team and what you think they would be like in your team. Very good. Um, something that that's else that's coming through in what you're saying, and it's very interesting that you're, I would almost say on purpose, like, but in a positive way, choosing that word leader consistently as opposed to a manager. And, and I like that because I don't think you can manage people, um, you know, they're, their their people like they'd be led but um yeah for, in your mind what's the difference between a between a leader and a, and a manager uh look i mean i think the word manager is a bit old school um you know a manager is there you know it kind of has i suppose it's kind of you know micromanagement those kind of things i just you know people are, aren't looking to be managed i think we need to empower people to manage their own day I think as you know a leader is there to guide support you know um, show a good example you know um, encourage people so it's more about trying to bring the best out in people and trying to give them the confidence to do their job I couldn't do the job that my team does they do it a lot better than I could do it I'm not there to try and do their job I'm there to try and help and support them, coach them. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm a leader. I'm not necessarily, I don't, I don't believe in micromanagement. Micromanagement will work short term, maybe on a little project or something. Long term, it won't. People will become demotivated. Um, you know, they'll start to disengage. Um, but, you know, leading, people will learn more through a leadership approach rather than a, a management or a, you know, a micromanagement approach. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, observing you from afar, Sandra, one of, one of the things that have impressed me over the years is your ability to continuously grow and move from your comfort zone into your learning zone. Um, you're quite involved with Oracle Women in Leadership. Tell me a little bit about some of the work you're doing there and the challenges maybe that face women in tech as well. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a, something that I'm, I'm quite passionate about and something, to be honest, in the next few years, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on as well. 
Um, I mean, I think uh, in my team, I'm actually lucky to have quite a split of 50-50 in my team. But generally, you know, even across the BDG, if we look at it, you know, and even if we move into sales, then it is much more heavily, um, you know, male dominated, let's say, than, than female dominated. Um, like in the area, that, things that I've, you know, try and do is even with my team is, you know, try and encourage them to attend the different OWL sessions. For example, there was one on last week around, you know, learning by failing, uh, which is a great topic. Um, and, you know, just, I think, you know, I, I've also got a couple of people in Cairo and my team, two, two females uh, in Cairo. And it's obviously a different culture. Um, but just making sure that it's inclusive, that, you know, that we've got, because, you know, the OWL community has, is now, you know, it now encompasses LGBTQ, um, you know, diversity, everything else. So it's making sure that, you know, we're, we're diverse, we're inclusive um, and, you know, obviously that female aspect. So I'd, I'd love to get more people into STEM type roles, um, even in my children's school. Um, I volunteered to go in to do some sessions um, around STEM um, to the primary school um, students because they have like a STEM week. What's STEM, um, Sandra? Sorry, I, I, I'm not so aware of So it. it's like technology. It's, you know, the STEM kind of uh, the technology the roles typically that would be more male dominated, let's say. Okay. So um, I know technology is one of them. Engineering. Uh, I'm not 100% sure science what the S and the M are, yeah. sense, science actually, and then, I, yeah, maybe manufacturer, I don't know. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I never heard that, so, that's, that's a new yeah. learning. <laughs> there you go. Uh, they're actually big on it in schools as right. well, uh, both encouraging STEM within, you know, the boys, but also in particular with the girls as well. Okay, super. Yeah. Um, so just just one or two last questions as we begin to finish up the the role of the leader as, as you mentioned there the you know it's come from that manager kind of in the industrial age where they were the educated person they told everybody what to do and now we're looking at the leadership and generations in in your mind how do you think things might evolve over the next 10 years for a leader i think covid has obviously been a game changer okay so leaders um there have always been virtual leaders but i think more so now uh, you know, a va the vast majority of leaders nowadays are, are at every level within the organization are doing it virtually. So I think virtual leadership is, um, is obviously going to be one of the challenges. Um, and obviously, you know, most of us certainly in the, in the tech space at the moment have been doing that for the past 11 months. Uh, whereas typically I would have done leadership on a, you know, in the office, I would have been in the office five days a week. My team would have been in the office five days a week. Um, so I think that's one of the, the big um, one of the big changes. I think there's also a lot more focus now and a lot more kind of enablement uh, at a leadership level um, around emotional intelligence, uh, which I think is is hugely valuable. So it's not all about the numbers. You know, I think emotional intelligence is a, is, a, is an area where I think we will see um, leaders becoming stronger and more aware of their emotional intelligence. Um, so for me, they'd be they'd be the two the two things I think that will change considerably, and that will be more focus on and more awareness of over the next uh, even in the next few years. Okay, great stuff. And um, last question for today, Sandra: If you could have done the last twenty years differently, is there anything you'd have done differently? Yeah, my first ten years, I would have spent more time doing training. Right. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not big at looking back on regrets, but if I could do those first 10 years more, uh, certainly in the company that I work in where there's enough training to keep you busy 24 <laughs> seven, I probably just didn't spend enough time on me. Um, and I, so that's probably one of the things, let's say if I was to, you know, to, to do those 10 years again, I would have spent more time uh, on my enablement every quarter, not just once or twice a year. But actually, you know, setting out on a quarterly basis, what am I going to do? What trainings are there out there? What have my colleagues done? What do other people do? Not just around soft skills, but also the hard skills. Um, so, for example, analytical skills are very beneficial. Excel, you know, how to read reports, how to manipulate reports, hugely valuable for anyone at any level within a company. But much more so as you move into a management level. It's actually it's a it's a massive asset to have. 
uh, to be able to read, interpret, um, dig in, understand, talk about, feel confident um, around numbers. Yeah, completely agree, particularly as, as we move to the data-driven enterprise. One last question, actually. Sorry, I, yes. I said that now twice, but it popped into my head as you were speaking there. When we met back in maybe October time, you mentioned uh, something to me that I, I think it'd be really helpful for, for other people to hear about. Every time you meet someone in an organization, they're actually kind of interviewing you and to yes. be aware of that. If you just talk a little bit about that, because it was a great tip. Yeah, so, you know, obviously... Um, and I suppose I've learned this myself because I've done this in the past. I've seen a job internally. I've gone for I've gone for that informal chat with the hiring manager or with somebody on the team. So oh, tell me a little bit more about that job and not realizing that actually that's the first interview. So although you haven't gone, you haven't applied for that job, they are still making a first impression on, of you. They are seeing, is this the right person? You know, does would she fit into this team? Um, you know, what's her motivations for leaving? So they're asking you questions. Um, a lot of the time they are asking you questions they would ask you in a formal setting. Just because it's not in a formal interview setting doesn't mean they're not forming an opinion of you. So one of my greatest tips uh, to anyone ever, <laughs> especially to anyone in my team, is if you're, you know, anytime you're meeting with people and talking about a job or positioning yourself as you would like to move into a particular role, you are being interviewed. Yeah, it was a super tip. And, and I'll say this as well, Sandra, you gave me some fantastic feedback there. Like, and it, it, again, it shows your authenticity and your honesty. You said, look, Connell, that answer there you gave me just wasn't good enough. You're going to have to clean it up. And it actually made me think, Jesus, actually, Sandra was right about that. Yeah, I, I, I need to clean that answer up. So when I'm asked it again, it's much more polished. Um, so that was good advice. So I appreciate that. It's okay. <laughs> uh, very good. So I think just to sum up there, Sandra, a couple of things that are popping out for me based on what you're saying. We spoke at, uh, earlier on about your family having good balance and structure, but then being being smart with your time um, and ensuring that what you're doing is adding value. And then we move to your team, having the right people around you, letting go when you step into a leadership role is, is, is a big thing and maybe becoming a little bit more skilled with that and empowering the guys around you. We spoke about leadership versus management and perhaps that management style is no longer applicable and it might work for a small time, but over, over a long period of time, it'll just demotivate people. Then we moved into the, the women in tech conversation, which is usually interesting and topical and diversity in general, like looking for that gender balance. And of course, a high performing team has a good level of diversity in it. And it's one of the reasons I love working where we do, because there's so many cultures coming together. You mentioned Cairo yeah. there for argument's sake. And then some, some great tips there, I think, for people. And it's, again, it's coming through with all of the leaders that I speak with. It's about spending the time on yourself to learn to develop and, and data being able to leverage data to make better decisions and speak about it and, and deliver insights yeah yeah and just one final thing so i attended um i was lucky enough to, to be nominated to attend a training with the irish management institute uh last year and one of the things i had to do during that time was to come up with what or to kind of articulate what is my management style and it took me a while to think. It took me a couple of days, actually. And I got it down to about a sentence. And then I got it down to four words. And then I happened to be in the shower one day and I got it down to two words. And it was magic. <laughs> I felt brilliant to get it down to two words. And those words are, my management style is about facilitating growth. So it's Very facilitating good. growth within my team. Every person in my team, I'm looking for them to grow. I'm looking for us to grow the number. I'm looking for us to grow our outputs. I'm looking for us to grow what we achieve. I'm looking for them to grow as individuals. I'm looking to grow our contribution to the business. I'm looking to grow the number of projects that we do. I'm looking to grow everything. They meant re one revenue. But also I'm looking to grow myself. I'm looking to grow our brand. So everything. So really anything that I do or anything that I'd like my team to do, uh, you know, it's about facilitating growth. Super. Thanks. I'm actually glad you brought that up because it was in the back of my mind too, Sandra. Great stuff. Thank you for Very making good. time this week. No problem. Thank you, Connell. You're welcome. Absolutely f <laughs> fantastic stuff there from, from Sandra. Um, honestly, if, if you were to see her at work, she's, she's so engaged. Her team all love her. Uh, she's always putting herself up for 
extra projects, stretching herself, getting involved in different activities around the organization. And she's very much a role model. And I've learned a huge, huge amount from her. And it's great that she's so authentic. She brings that, that, that Sandra as the mother, Sandra as the leader, all into one sort of individualistic thing and, and, and allows people to see that. Uh, because I think there's, there's a great saying that, that um, actually a coach I used to work with used to continuously say to me, and I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but it was said by Gandhi. And it was like, life is one, is one indivisible whole. You can't do well in one part whilst you're doing bad in another. So it's, it's not great to compartmentalize and all. I'm great at work and I'm bad at home and I'm great with my hobbies and I'm bad at this. So remember that it's like one apple and if the apple is rotten, then the apple is rotten. The whole apple is rot- rotten. And likewise, likewise with your life, it's important to try and bring your best self to everything that you do. Great stuff. So um, thanks a million for listening. Please like, share, sub- subscribe to the podcast. And also, again, if anybody knows anybody else who you could recommend who would be uh, good to come on the podcast, or if you'd like to come on yourself, just drop me a line. It's been great. I've people recommending books, people recommending guests, people offering to come on to the show. And uh, we've uh, good got a lot of guests lined up for the next couple of weeks. So have a great week. Thanks so much for listening to Aspirational Leadership, Making the Move into Leadership. In the review section, please comment what's one learning you've taken from this week's podcast and what's one action you'll take based on the learning. Tune in again next week where we'll speak with another inspirational leader who'll share their story with us. And remember, like, share and subscribe to the podcast.